In part one, we introduced some basic concepts of software-defined radios. We learned a little about front-end filters, I and Q, that is in-phase and quadrature, A to D conversion, DSP, or digital signal processing, the Nyquist frequency, Nyquist zones, undersampling, oversampling, direct sampling, aliasing, decimation, FPGAs, and a bit more. If you're a little hazy about any of this, I'd recommend watching part one first, or maybe again. What's common among SDRs is that beautiful, highly detailed spectrum display and waterfall, sometimes called a pan adapter, with handy features like drag tuning and click tuning. SDRs have variable digital receive filters with very steep sides. Never buy a $100 roofing filter again. They are full featured with everything you'd expect in a modern radio and more. Direct sampling is today's SDR technology. My first direct sampling transceiver was the Hermes board, and it was just that, a fully operational printed circuit board. I bought it in December 2013 from Apache Labs in India for $900. Pretty cheap for a direct sampling radio at the time. It had a 16-bit A to D, sampling at 122.88 megahertz and was reported to be a top performer. I purchased the recommended Hammond enclosure, made a small circuit board to hold a TR relay and possibly some receiver preselector filters. I later added a 5 watt amplifier. In November of 2014 I added an ELAD FDM Duo 8 watt transceiver. I built a Hard Rock 50 amplifier kit then later modified my Ameritron ALS 600 so it would deliver full power when driven with only 5 watts. In 2018 I added an SDR play RSP1A, an Expert Electronics Calibri Nano, and an ELAD S1, all SDR receivers, as well as an Expert Electronics Sun SDR2 QRP transceiver. I did all this to learn more about SDRs, and the one big thing I discovered was that there are significant differences, and that's what we're going to talk about. Don't dismiss the SDR receivers for use in your ham shack either. It's quite possible to combine an inexpensive SDR receiver with your present transceiver. It won't cost you a bundle to try out all these SDR goodies. I think you'll get hooked. Here in part two, we're going to look at SDR hardware. I'll talk about the radios I have, and from time to time mention the Flex and Apache Labs radios, as well as the ICOM 7300 and 7610. They are all major players in the SDR world, and all except SDR play make direct sampling receivers or transceivers. By now you should have a pretty good understanding of most SDR terminology and most importantly recognize the difference between a direct conversion SDR receiver and a direct sampling SDR receiver where everything is digitized right at the antenna. There is an ever-growing variety of SDR receivers and transceivers available. I can only scratch the surface. Let's first look at the SDR Play RSP1A receiver, the only radio I'll talk about that's not direct sampling. It's so inexpensive and popular, I thought it would be worth trying. The RSP1A is very small and costs about $100. I'm making this video in 2018, well, now into 2019, so keep that in mind. Considering it's not a direct sampler, I was impressed with the performance. The radio itself is a single printed circuit board inside a 3 by 3.5 by 1 inch plastic enclosure. Power is provided through the USB computer connection. There is a small SMA connector for the antenna. The RF front end has some pretty extensive band pass filters. There are even some band rejection filters to further attenuate the AM and FM broadcast bands as strong local broadcast stations are likely suspects for causing front-end or A to D overload. 
tiny surface mount filters switch with tiny ICRF switches make a compact and inexpensive front end filtering system. For comparison, here's a more traditional relay controlled front end filter bank. Alone, it sells for twice the price of the RSP1A. Things are changing. Ultimately, I and Q are created in the analog domain, then go to A to D converters, one for I and one for Q. The spectrum, though, can be much wider than the earlier sound card SDRs, up to 10 MHz or so. All the IQ processing, along with A to D conversion and the necessary processing to feed the data via USB to the computer, is accomplished in two integrated circuits from Miric Semiconductor. The MSI001 handles all the analog stuff. Various bands of frequencies are amplified by band-optimized low-noise amplifiers, or LNAs. The lower frequencies are mixed with a local oscillator. This upconverted output is combined with the rest of the amplified signals from the antenna and goes to two converters, one for I and one for Q. A synthesized VFO is also fed to both mixers with no phase shift for the I channel and 90 degrees phase shift for the Q channel, just like we talked about in part one. A little filtering and amplification and the analog I and Q signals go to the next chip, the Mirix MSI 2500. The 2500 digitizes I and Q, then does a little digital signal processing and feeds the USB controller. There is also a microcontroller and a reference clock generator. A USB cable then hands everything over to your computer. What's amazing, if my conversion from the Chinese yuan to the US dollar is correct, is that both of these chips can be had for less than four dollars. That's a total for both chips. While SDR play touts that it uses 14-bit A to D conversion, a quick look at their spec sheet raises some questions. 10.66 megasamples per second is the maximum, yielding about a 10 megahertz spectrum display. Pretty good. But look a little more closely. It's only 8-bit resolution above 9.216 megasamples per second, and you only get the full 14 bits below about 6 megasamples per second. Just keep the sampling rate low for best performance. The dynamic range of the RSP1A is somewhat limited, but the extensive front-end filtering and input level control help a lot. For $100, it's a pretty good value. And it works pretty well on VHF and UHF frequencies, too, right out of the box. Unlike the RSP1A, the Calibri Nano from Expert Electronics in Russia is a direct sampling receiver. It's two and a half times the price of the RSP1A, but then it's a big improvement. Direct sampling does it. The Calibri Nano is really small. You could put about a half a dozen of them inside the RSP1A enclosure. The small printed circuit board is clamped between two rugged metal shells, which make an excellent heat sink. It gets noticeably warm. A USB connection provides power and data link to your computer, there's an SMA connector for the antenna. The inside of the Calibri Nano is a thing of beauty. A heavy-duty PC board is populated with components on both sides, and the analog front end is well separated from the digital side. The simple Calibri Nano block diagram is very straightforward. The antenna feeds a 55 megahertz low-pass anti-aliasing filter, which allows only frequencies below the Nyquist frequency, one-half the 122.88 megahertz sampling frequency, or the first Nyquist zone, remember? If you tune above 55 megahertz, the filter is bypassed. All the Nyquist zones, up to 500 megahertz, are now merged, and it's pretty much a mess. However, the ability to bypass the 55 megahertz filter allows filters or preamps to be inserted in the antenna line and does not preclude using the higher Nyquist zones. Because local FM broadcast stations are so strong, I find that they may be tuned even in stereo without any filters. When I tune other VHF frequencies, though, I still find mostly FM broadcast stations. Filters are needed to fully utilize all those higher frequencies and fortunately can be added externally. 
Next is a digital variable gain amplifier, or DVGA. The digital part refers to control of the amplifier. It's still an analog amplifier. Maybe a better name would be a digitally controlled variable gain amplifier. The gain can be set over a range of 37.5 dB. Moving on to the next block in the Calibra Nano, we see that the ADC driver is an LTC 6400-26 made by Linear Technology. We also see that we can buy one for $7.53 from DigiKey. The next block is the analog to digital converter. They only tell us that it's a 14-bit at 122.88 megahertz. Could be the analog device's LTC 220814. You get one of those from Mauser for $90.52. High-speed A to D converters do cost more. All that data from the A to D goes to an FPGA, Max 10. Ah, the Altera Max 10. A rather small FPGA with 8K LE. That says it has 8,000 logic elements, not 8,000 gates as we might expect. It is a gate array after all. And yes, we're talking about those simple AND and OR gates, the most basic logic elements. While gates are the building blocks of all things digital, more complex logic elements like shift registers, latches, counters, multiplexers, decoders, flip-flops, and more can be part of an FPGA. But then all those logic elements are made up of gates. You can get one Max 10 from DigiKey for $25.68. Next is an FT232H USB controller. We can get one of these from DigiKey for a measly $4.25. Then the processing goes on to the computer. Expert Electronics also provides us with an architecture description. It's pretty much the same as the block diagram, except it tells us a little about what's going on inside the FPGA. It's the same down conversion and creation of I and Q that occurs in the MSI 001 used in the SDR play. What's different? We're now doing it digitally. With direct sampling, the numerically controlled oscillator isn't really an oscillator at all. It's just some math that does the conversion. The 90 degrees phase shift, just math, and it's all perfect. Some control is also being done in the FPGA, then it's on to the PC for more processing. In many ways, the ELAD S1 receiver is comparable to the Calibri Nano. It also has a 14-bit A to D converter, but only samples at 61.44 MHz, good for frequencies up to 30 MHz in the sub Nyquist mode. The S1 costs about $40 more, but adds a few other goodies, including a 9-pin external I.O. connector. This allows control of external devices, such as pre-selector filters. You can mute the receiver through the I.O. 2, making it easier to use with an existing transceiver. There's an SMA antenna connector and a USB connector for data and power from the PC. Inside, the S1 looks quite different from the Calibri Nano, but has the same basic architecture. As an indication of continuing price erosion, the ELAD site has a receiver comparison which shows an S1 essential in addition to the S1. It's missing the I.O. connector, but otherwise looks pretty much like the S1. No U.S. price listed, but it looks like it should be around $200. If true, that would be the cheapest direct sampler I've seen. Don't discount the option of adding a relatively inexpensive SDR receiver to your present transceiver. Use free software like ECAD or OmniRig to synchronize your new SDR receiver to your present rig. Then feed antenna connections from both radios, as well as an antenna, to a switch box like the MFJ1708 SDR or the ELAD ASW1 switch box. Your radio must be reasonably modern, allowing control using CAT commands. Software like HDSDR can provide a really nice spectrum waterfall, as well as drag or click tuning. You now have a choice. Listen to your radio's receiver or to the SDR through your computer. There's a good chance the SDR's receiver will be better than your radio's. 
I'd like to try to clarify some terms that have a particular meaning in the direct sampling SDR world. Back in the Superhead days, if you had two receivers, you had two hardware receivers. But now you can have multiple receivers in multiple spectrum displays, all done in software, and all fed from one hardware receiver connected to one antenna. You can even have more than one hardware receiver. The hardware receiver, consisting of the input circuitry feeding an A to D converter, has a variety of names. Flex calls it a spectral capture unit. Apache Labs state that their rodeos have dual 16-bit phase synchronous ADCs. In other words, two hardware receivers. Most SDRs have only one of them, and as I've just described, can still simultaneously receive many frequencies. To my knowledge, there are only five radios with two hardware receivers widely available today, with each supporting multiple software receivers, the ANAN 7000DLE and 8000DLE, and the Flex 6700, 6600, and 6600M. New things keep showing up, though. I see the Odyssey 2 has dual 122.8 MHz 16-bit A to Ds and promises a price of around $800. This could be a real bargain. As a contrast, the ICOM 7300 has one hardware receiver and can still tune only one frequency. The 7610 has two hardware receivers but can still tune only two frequencies. No additional virtual receivers here. Let's take a look at some transceivers. Here's a block diagram of the Hermes board, and as you can see, it's considerably more complex than the receivers I discussed. That's because the Hermes board offers many extras, like an input for an external precision clock reference, or a low-level transmit output for transverters or for use as a precision signal generator, and more. Not all SDRs offer these capabilities, and it's nice to have them when you want them. I want to draw your attention to only a couple of things, though. First, the receive antenna input is pretty much like the Calibri Nano in the S1. Antenna, low-pass anti-aliasing filter, attenuator driver, then to the A to D converter, a linear technology LTC2208. Also notice that all the digital stuff funnels into the FPGA, an Altera EP3C40, a 40,000 logic element device considerably larger than the 8,000 logic elements in the MAX-10 in the Calibri Nano. In contrast to the USB connection to the computer used by the SDR Play in Calibri Nano, the Hermes uses Ethernet. The Hermes board is no longer available from Apache Labs or, or any place else that I could find. The present offerings from Apache Labs are the ANAN 7000 DLE and the ANAN 8000 DLE both having dual front ends with dual A to D converters. They do use the same HPSDR software as the Hermes, however, so most operations using the Hermes are the same as today's Apache Labs offering. New software options are showing up for the A9 radios. I'll talk about those a little bit in part three. Notice in this picture of the Hermes, there's only one hardware receiver you see only one antenna connection going through the input chain to one A to D converter, making it a single hardware receiver. The big chip in the center is the FPGA. For comparison, this is the Orion Mark II board used in the newer Apache Labs A9 series radios. Notice two antenna connections going to separate input chains, then to two A to D converters. So it has two hardware radios with two antenna connections. The huge FPGA contains more than 150,000 logic elements. I see you can now buy an Orion Mark II for $1,695 from Apache Labs, then add your own enclosure, antenna, TR relay, and possibly filters as I did with the Hermes. The Orion puts out 2 watts, so you might get by without adding an intermediate amplifier. Since so much can be accomplished with just one hardware receiver, the single most significant advantage of having two hardware receivers is diversity reception. But not all diversity reception is created equal. 
The Apache Lab's diversity using Power SDR MRX allows relative phase and amplitude adjustments to steer the antenna pattern. I don't see any such controls in the flex radios, though. There are some other advantages of two hardware receivers under some conditions, but I'm quite happy with my single front-end hardware receivers, with multiple virtual receivers on multiple spectrum displays. That's only possible with direct sampling receivers, since all the data representing a wide range of frequencies, 30 megahertz or more, is always available. Multiple segments of that data can then be used to create multiple spectra. For instance, in the Calibra Nano, we see that a single IQ pair is created in the FPGA, then goes to the computer through a USB connection. Multiple virtual receivers can be created in the computer's software, but only within the range of that one spectrum. There is no other data available to the computer. By contrast, look at the Expert Sun SDR QRP transceiver. Two IQ pairs can be created, each with its own numerically controlled oscillator or NCO. Thus, two spectra can be created in the FPGA, and each can then be independently tuned in the computer. Notice that a single A to D converter feeds both. Since this is a transceiver, a digital transmit chain, that is digital up conversion, is also included. And all this is done in a single but larger FPGA. In the Hermes board, seven individual spectra could be created, but only two are utilized by the HPSDR software. The radios I've discussed so far have all followed a consistent pattern. I and Q are created within the radio, in some cases as analog signals like the SDR play receivers. Alternatively, I and Q are created digitally in direct sampling receivers, like all the other radios I'm talking about. In either case, they are typically then fed to the computer in digital form, where the remaining processing takes place. A notable exception is the Flex 6000 series, which does all the digital signal processing in the radio. Only control is done in the computer. That control could be a Windows computer running smart SDR software, or maybe an iPad or the Maestro, with some knobs and buttons, an 8-inch touchscreen, and an embedded version of Windows. The Maestro alone cost $1,200, though, more than the ELAD FDM Duo and a number of other radios. The Maestro functions can be included in the same box as the 6400 or 6600, making them the 6400M or the 6600M. I'd like to point out a basic design difference between the Duo and the Flex M models of the Maestro. The Flex 6400 and 6600 always need a computer to operate. That computer, running smart SDR software, can simply be provided by you, or by adding the Maestro, or essentially including the Maestro in the radio box, thus adding an M to the model designation and $1,000 to the price. The Duo takes a different approach. It operates standalone with its FPGA and three microprocessors along with the required firmware software that's more or less permanently embedded inside the device. Run the included Windows software and add a ton of features, including eight receivers and a dozen spectra. The knobs and buttons are not an added extra cost. The ICOM 7300 and 7610 obviously do everything in the radio, but it appears they do not use wideband I and Q as I've been describing. They talk about a 36 kilohertz IF, so, so they're doing something different. And there are no multiple virtual receivers within a spectrum either. You cannot simply add SDR software and have both like the Duo. Although in August 2018, ICOM announced 7610 compatibility with the HD SDR software that could add a lot of capability. Expert Electronics put their radio in the same box with a Windows computer, added a bunch of knobs and buttons, and called it the MB1. It's a complete 100-watt SDR transceiver in a box. It has a full version of Windows running on a full-blown internal computer, along with many knobs and buttons, and a large screen. All the usual computer connections are available on the back, and the computer can be used for any purpose. 
It seems pretty nice, but not cheap, around 5,600 bucks. You can get by but for considerably less, though. There are many options available from several manufacturers to add knobs and buttons to just about any SDR. You can get the Pi HP SDR controller for your Anon radio for about $600, or an ecoder control panel for your Expert Electronics rig for $300, or the flex radio control knob with three buttons for 150 or the ELAD TM2 for 272 Some have even used a DJ controller with a bunch of knobs and buttons. As we discussed in part one, all direct sampling receivers need anti-aliasing filters, so the only real requirement is a low-pass filter at the Nyquist frequency, half the sampling frequency, remember? All my radios with direct sampling receivers, except the Hermes board, are able to bypass the low-pass filter, so the higher frequencies might be received in the higher Nyquist zones. In that case, band pass filters for the appropriate Nyquist zone would be required, and can be added externally. Pre-selector filters for each amateur band are usually not needed in direct sampling receivers. I live near Cleveland, Ohio, and I receive several local AM and FM broadcast stations with signals near 50 dB over S9. All my direct sampling radios can tune anywhere, with no attenuation and with only anti-aliasing filters. There are, however, extreme situations where some amateur band pre-selector filtering might be helpful. Field day, a neighborhood ham, or maybe a 50 kWAM broadcast station nearby come to mind. The solution is to add an external filter. ELAD offers a wide selection that can be easily controlled by the ELAD radios. Each filter is a small PC board that plugs into either the radio itself or an external enclosure. The new Duo Art amplifiers also can accept these filters. Yes, they are receive filters, and the amp is just a handy place to put them. They have a wide variety of filters as well as blank boards to build your own. There's a high pass inline filter to reject the AM broadcast band. It can handle 10 watts, so you can put it in the TR antenna line with the QRP rig. Filters and preamps are available for specific bands in the Super Nyquist range. There's an experimenter's board, an enclosure available. Make whatever you need. ELAD does have a wide variety of accessories. You can find an even wider selection of filters, converters, and more at Harris Technology. My feeling is that since these filters are needed only in extreme conditions, it's better to add them only when needed. That keeps the cost of the radio down while the added filtering can be tailored to solve the problem at hand. Let's take a little closer look at what happens and what doesn't happen when we use those band pre-selector filters with direct sampling receivers. We can see on this super wide 60 megahertz spectrum waterfall in the Expert SDR2 software how the filters are switched as I tune up in frequency in 1 MHz steps. The waterfall shows this very well. As I zoom in a little, notice the large hump of power that is the AM broadcast band, as well as many strong phase signals at higher frequencies. When I activate the filters, you can see that the strength of all those unwanted signals is drastically reduced. What's significant, though, is that it makes no difference to the band I'm trying to receive. You might think that all those very strong signals being digitized along with the one you want might have a negative effect, but that's not what happens. Those filters are simply not needed except in extreme circumstances. You may have noticed that all three of my transceivers are QRP rigs. Since I now have amplifiers that work with 5 watts drive, it kind of makes sense to have all QRP. They're small, light, portable, and cheaper. And shipping back for repairs is simple and inexpensive. Just something to think about. I want to talk about one other SDR receiver because it's so unique. It's the Kiwi SDR, providing coverage up to 30 megahertz. This direct sampling SDR is made specifically for access over the internet. 
It does that very well, but I wouldn't recommend it in your shack. The single board Kiwi direct sampling SDR is made to ride piggyback on the tiny BeagleBone computer. A GPS receiver even provides ultra precision frequency control. There is no monitor, keyboard, or mouse. The BeagleBone provides an Ethernet connection to the Internet, and that's the only way to use the Kiwi. Here in part two, I've been talking about multiple virtual receivers, but using a single hardware receiver. Well, the Kiwi can provide four virtual receivers to four separate users over the Internet all at the same time. Each has complete control over the radio and is unaware of what others may be doing. You'll find none of those pre-selector filters here, as each user must be able to receive any frequency. Audio is fed to the user as demodulated and compressed audio, not wideband I and Q as we discussed earlier. A spectrum is fed separately as simply display information. This allows using a much lower bandwidth than sending the complete I and Q. Thus a super high speed internet connection is not needed. I see less than 200 kilobits per second internet data usage when using Kiwi. This is not quite as flexible as sending the complete I and Q, but I think the trade-off for much lower data speeds is worth it. You can get the Kiwi, BeagleBone computer, and the reference GPS all for about $300. And of course you can use Kiwi receivers all over the world for free. Just look up w8kfj at qrz.com where I have a list of SDR links including Kiwi SDR. It could provide a handy remote receiver too. I recall a particular QSO where the other station was having difficulty receiving me. He said things were fine, though, because he could receive me through his remote receiver in Virginia. He, he later admitted to using a free Kiwi receiver. This is not the end of the story. What we have discussed here is only the beginning. Hopefully my examples have given you a foundation that will make it easier to evaluate other SDRs. There are now many options, and there will certainly be more in the future. In part three, we'll see how the software puts it all together. We'll really get into user interface as there are significant differences.